Today, we have an exciting presentation by Shireen Khan at ChemPartner on the discovery and characterization of potent anti pdl one antibodies in just weeks. Shireen is the Senior Director of Biologics at ChemPartner, where she leads a group that has expanded ChemPartner's capabilities into single B-cell cloning on the Beacon platform. She also leads multiple therapeutic antibody discovery programs for biotech and pharmaceutical companies. Prior to ChemPartner, Shireen led the Functional Biology Group at Zoma and advanced several therapeutic candidates through in vitro and in vivo efficacy studies. Shireen received her PhD in biology at the University of California, San Diego. After today's presentation, Anupam Singhal from Berkeley Lights, their product manager for antibody therapeutics, and Noah Ditto, Cartera's technical product manager, will join us for a panel discussion. Please submit your questions with the question box on the right. I'll hand it over to you now, Shireen. Thank you, John, and thank you to Cartera for inviting us to present our proof of concept study that we did with Berkeley Lights. So we did a project with Berkeley Lights to discover potent anti pdl one antibodies on the Beacon platform by single plasma B-cell cloning. Once we selected the candidates and expressed and purified them, we were able to collaborate with uh, Cartera on the LSA platform to do some epitope binning analyses as well as evaluation of all of our candidates that came from the single plasma B-cell cloning approach versus a parallel hybridoma approach that we had done in our facility in Shanghai. So by being able to evaluate all of the candidates side by side, we really had a good idea of what the relative affinities of those antibody candidates were, and also the relationships uh, between the antibodies with respect to the epitopes. So in terms of antibody discovery approaches, we have a few to select from, including phage display, hybridoma, and B-cell cloning. So each of these methods has their pros and cons. Um, in particular, for duration, phage display as well as B-cell cloning can be a quicker approach to identifying the best candidates. Um, in terms of the repertoire for phage display, it's either natural or designed. And by uh, both hybridoma and B-cell cloning, it's a natural repertoire because um, typically you're relying on animal immunizations. But the number of members that you can evaluate by uh, B-cell cloning tends to be far greater. Certainly um, on the beacon, it's in the tens of thousands of single B-cells that we can evaluate compared to around 10,000 um, by hybridoma technology. Um, for each of these methods, um, again, there's, there's pros and cons in terms of antigens. So by phage display, there's more flexibility in terms of the types of antigens that you can work with, but it tends to be more challenging for um, uh, targets where there's limited extracellular domains such as GPCRs or ion channels. But we've had success by um, animal immunization with either cells overexpressing the target or genetic immunization. Um, by hybridoma or B-cell cloning. So accessing these more challenging targets is feasible by those two methods. Um, in terms of affinity, there may be a need for affinity maturation from a phage display library, um, whereas for both hybridoma and B-cell cloning, you're taking advantage of that in vivo affinity maturation that occurs. Um, the screening for format, of course, varies between phage display being SCFE or FAB versus hybridoma, and B-cell cloning is directly looking at the IgGs. So all of these methods taken together, uh, we really see B-cell cloning as an opportunity to take the best of both worlds that come from either phage display or hybridoma. So for B-cell cloning, again, no need necessarily for affinity maturation if you can pull out good candidates uh, based on that in vivo affinity maturation. There's potential for greater sampling of the immune repertoire than you can do by hybridoma. Um, accelerated discovery, similar to uh, phage display, but you also get the sequences early, similar to phage display. 
But what we really think is the advantage of B-cell cloning is the opportunity to bring function forward in the drug discovery process and be able to identify candidates earlier in the process that have the ideal functional properties. So at ChemPartner, we have the Berkeley Lights Beacon platform in order to accelerate our antibody discovery process. So on the left there is a picture of the Beacon platform. It can accommodate up to four of the OptoSelect chips as shown in the middle of the slide here. And on these chips, um, there are thousands of these sub-nanoliter chambers called nanopens. And on the platform, we're able to use controlled light patterns to move single B cells around and sequester them within these nanopens. And by doing so, we can allow them to culture and secrete antibodies and subsequently assay for target-specific binding as well as functional properties. So what we see as the value proposition for this platform is being able to do functional assays up front. So on the left there, you can see that there's beads um, and then potentially cells that can be loaded into the channels of these chips. And so if you have your beads coated with the target of interest or cells overexpressing the target, it's possible to see blooms above the pens where there's B, B cells secreting target-specific antibodies. And you see that nice accumulation of signal right around um, the nanopens where those, those B cells are located. And so it's possible to do multiplexing assays in this format to look for antigen specificity as well as cross-reactive binding. So in the past, we've been able to do in a multiplex format binding to human, mouse, as well as sino uh, proteins. And so other potential assays that we could develop on the platform include cytokine release, potentially epitope binning experiments can be done right on the platform, as well as gene expression assays and cytotoxicity assays. So we're constantly thinking of new assays that we can develop for the platform to really kind of enable this, uh, this capability. So this is what the B-cell cloning antibody discovery wo workflow looks like. Of course, starting from the immunizations, we will harvest either the bone marrow, lymph nodes, or spleen from the immunized animals and then do the, the isolations in our South San Francisco location. Um, we'll do the loading onto the beacon as well as binding and functional assays, export the hits, and uh, prepare the cDNA, do the VHVL amplification, we send it out for sequencing, and then once we get those sequences back, we, we will do the cloning, expression, and purification in our Shanghai facility, and potentially functional characterization of the purified antibodies. So we initiated a collaboration project between ChemPartner and Berkeley Lights in order to generate antibodies targeting PDL1. And there are several clinical candidates that we could actually directly compare the output from B cell cloning compared to a standard hybridoma approach, which is what we would typically do um, for a campaign such as this. So we wanted to basically evaluate the functional properties of the antibodies, including binding, affinity, diversity of sequences, as well as epitope coverage. We had I used identical reagents for immunization by IP, and similar assays were done um, at the screening stage, either on the beacon or by hybridoma super, supernatant screening. We harvested the spleen and bone marrow for both of these methods, and we used two strains of of mice for the hybridoma campaign. We standardly use SJL as well as BALB-C. And on the beacon platform, we only used BALB-C animals for this study. Um, the detection methods were quite different. So on beacon, it's an image-based detection system, whereas by hybridoma supernatant, we were either doing fax-based binding or ELISA binding and blocking assays.
And so Camp Partner was set up uniquely to be able to provide all of the reagents needed for this proof of concept study. So we generated the reagents, uh, the recombinant proteins for immunization, the cell lines overexpressing either human or sino PDL1, as well as generating the recombinant antibodies that we then characterized in functional assays. So the Shanghai team developed binding assays as well as T cell activation and mixed lymphocyte reaction assays so that we could um, evaluate the functional properties of our uh, hits from each of these methods. We did the hybridoma um, approach in Shanghai, of course, and then the B-cell cloning was done in collaboration with Berkeley Lights. Uh, we did the VHVL sequencing in Shanghai and then uh, characterized the purified antibodies through a series of functional assays. Okay, so just comparing the B-cell cloning compared to hybridoma, um, if you look at the amount of time it takes to get to the sequences, now this is not including the immunization strategy and the amount of time it takes to do that um, schedule, but for B-cell cloning, you can pretty much get all the way through the VHVL sequencing of your hits within two to four weeks, whereas by hybridoma, after going through the entire process of fusion, um, ELISA binding, as well as um, cell-based binding and blocking assays in a primary and secondary screening format, followed by selection of your high-priority candidates for production and purification, you actually have about three to five months until you get to the sequencing results. Um, but the advantage here, of course, is that you're characterizing uh, purified antibodies um, before you're selecting the candidates for sequencing. Unfortunately, the, the downside of that is that sometimes it's very useful to have the sequence information up front so that you can select um, candidates based on their diversity of sequence and potentially evaluate whether you should select a set of leads and backups based on the sequence diversity. You can also look at um, liabilities in the sequence, um, but without that information and going through the entire process and selecting the leads can be a little bit risky. So the method that we used to evaluate blocking um, properties by hybridoma was um, basically an ELISA-based selection method. So we did a standard um, blocking or non-blocking assay by ELISA looking at whether biotinylated PD-1 bound um, to the human PD-L1 ECDFC in the presence of the anti-PD-L1 antibodies. And so in order to identify and select the hits, we, we cast a broad net, so the blocking activity that was anywhere in the range of 30 to 100 percent was selected as a hit um, at the primary screening stage using hybridoma supernatant. So it's a quantitative method, but casting a broader net would enable us to pull more blocking antibodies forward um, and then mitigate the risk of, of the potential for those clones dropping out during the subcloning process. And so the cell-based binding and blocking assays on the Beacon platform are image-based. So it's quite a bit different um, from that perspective um, compared to um, ELISA or fax-based methods. Um, but basically what we did for this particular project was load the pens with CHO K1 um, overexpressing human PDL1 and in that same pen is actually a B cell secreting target specific antibody. We also imported beads that are coated with human PDL1. And we assayed for in channel bead binding as well as in pen cell based binding. And so, in order to evaluate the blocking versus non blocking activity, 
what we did with the what we did then was to import soluble PD-1 that was fluorescently labeled. So basically, if the PD-1 was able to bind, that would indicate that it's a non-blocking antibody, as shown on the bottom right panels. And um, if it was able to um, exclude, if the antibody was able to exclude the ability of PD-1 to bind, you'd see very limited signal in the FITC channel, as shown on the upper right there. And you would see a strong signal in the Texas red channel suggesting that the antibody is present and it's binding to either beads or cells. And so that's how we categorized our antibodies in terms of blocking versus non-blocking activity. And so it's just a very different method, but um, we looked for uh, antibodies that had that stark contrast in terms of signal for the PD-1 in the Alexafluor 488 channel. So this slide shows the outcome of the B-cell cloning screening on the beacon platform versus the hybridoma primary and secondary screening results. So on the Beacon platform, we evaluated over 33,000 single B cells, and we looked at both bone marrow and spleen and found that there were over 200 cell-based binders to human PDL1, and a total of 35 blockers were identified. If you look at the distribution between the number of blockers from the bone marrow versus the spleen, in this experiment, it looked like most of the hits came from the bone marrow. We've done subsequent experiments and found that those numbers are usually more even between spleen and bone marrow. But it was interesting that a lot of these hits actually came from the bone marrow in this particular experiment. And in the hybridoma campaign, we found that a majority of the hits came from the spleen, in fact. And that's not surprising given that there was limited uh, success with the fusions that came from the bone marrow. Um, so basically we got more binders and blockers identified through the hybridoma campaign um, because of that broader net that we cast uh, for identifying or selecting a candidate as a hit. And so we had to narrow that down at the secondary screening stage to around 50 that we would then move forward into the subcloning stage. So you can see the total numbers of hybridoma clones screened are um, a little over 13,000 and 48 blockers were pulled through compared to the 35 blockers from the B-cell cloning method. So the next step in the process was to do the single B-cell sequencing. So out of the 35 blocking hits that we had, we were able to recover good sequences for 22 out of the 35. And so that's a recovery rate of about 60, between 60 and 70 percent um, in this particular experiment. But since then, we've been able to significantly improve that recovery rate and it's more around the range of 80% more recently. So those were then expressed and purified in Shanghai, and at the same time, 40 of the hybridoma antibodies that had the desired binding and blocking activity were purified. And so we compared the activity of each of these um, antibodies across multiple assays. So we looked at binding as well as blocking affinity and then the epitope binning profiles. And then we did additional functional assays including T cell activation compared to the benchmark antibodies which are shown in the table below here. Several anti pdl one antibodies from BMS, Roche, as well as Metamune AstraZeneca. So this is an example of the binding properties of the hybridoma versus B-cell cloning antibodies, looking at uh, binding to CHO K1 over expressing human PDL1. On the right is the benchmark antibodies, and you can see uh, for the hybridoma antibodies in general, we saw a broader range of um, maximum MFI by facts. Um, compared to the antibodies coming from B-cell cloning.
So it looked as if there were a lot of antibodies that had very similar profiles by beetle cloning, at least in this campaign. In this slide here, we're looking at the binding profiles of hybridoma versus B-cell cloning antibodies to the cells overexpressing SINOPDL1. And again, in this example, we're seeing that the maximum MFI varied for both the hybridoma as well as the B-cell cloning antibodies. And recall that we did not use uh, sino pdl one binding as a criteria for selecting our hits on the beacon. So uh, from that perspective, it's not so surprising that some of these candidates don't bind to sino as well um, as others. And so there's a broader range of what we ended up with, um, likely due to the lack of, of including this as a screen up front on the beacon. So in this slide, what we're showing is the outcome of the blocking assay results, the PD-1, PDL one blocking assay by ELISA using purified antibodies. And what you can see at the bottom there are the benchmark antibodies um, for both B-cell cloning as well as the hybridoma experiments, which were done at a different time. And you can see most of the time the IC50 values across the three different benchmark antibodies are around 0.5 nanomolar. And so if you compare that to the results with the B-cell cloning antibodies or the hybridoma antibodies, what you can see is that the B-cell cloning antibodies primarily had a tighter range of IC50 values, um, ranging there from about 0.4 to about 0.7. Um, compared to the hybridoma antibodies, there was a broader range of IC50 values. So that range from about 0.6 all the way up to 1.3. And again, this, this was likely very much due to the method by which we used to screen and select the blocking antibodies being very different on the beacon as sort of an image-based selection criteria that was probably very st uh, stringent compared to the hybridoma in which we cast that broader net. So the next studies that we did included affinity estimations of our antibodies using the BIACOR. So this was done on a BIACOR 8K, and what we did was capture through the FC the anti pdl one antibodies, and then we flowed the human pdl one ECD HIS material to be able to estimate uh, the affinities. In this slide, we're looking at the ISO affinity plots um, using the BIACOR. And uh, what we can see here in red are the benchmark antibodies, which are all sub-nanomolar affinity antibodies. And um, by the B-cell cloning method, we were able to identify at least two antibodies that had affinity in the same range as the benchmark antibodies. And there were several other antibodies that had um, um, affinity and higher um, off rates um, than um, the benchmark antibodies. On the right-hand side, you can see the sensorgrams for a tezolizumab compared to P1A6 and P1A2, which were our two uh, B-cell cloning antibodies that had the highest um, affinity. And so... What you can see is that at least two of the candidates that we identified had reasonable, a reasonably fast on rate and uh, slower dissociation curves and similar profiles in general compared to the benchmark antibody. And so if you think about the number of, number of B cells that we screened, um, 33,000 total, it's obviously a very low frequency event to find antibodies that actually had the sub nanomolar affinity. And so that kind of underscores the need to screen deeper into the immune repertoire to pull out candidates that actually have uh, properties similar to this. 
So we were very excited about the prospect of evaluating our B-cell cloning as well as hybridoma antibodies on the Cartera LSA. Um, so this platform itself was purpose-built by Cartera to support antibody characterization by conducting um, a lot of screening using minimal sample volume. So the LSA name uh, comes from Lodestar, a reference point used for navigation, and it kind of alludes to the purpose of the instrument, which is to help scientists take large pools of candidates and figure out the optimal uh, candidates to move forward with based on um, um, biochemical properties. So the LSA is unique among biosensors based on its ability to switch fluidic modes between the arraying of up to 384 ligands, followed by single injection across this array in a single channel mode. So from each injection, real-time binding signals are measured for the 384 active surfaces, plus 48 separate interspot references. Additionally, the bidirectional flow used in creating the array and associating analytes during binding analysis allows for robust signals to be measured out of very low concentration samples, such as crude supernatants like you'd find in a hybridoma screening mode. So the applications that can be leveraged on the LSA platform include affinity measurement assays, either by global kinetics or steady state affinity. In addition to that, epitope characterization such as epitope binning, where antibodies sharing common epitopes are clustered, or epitope mapping, which identifies domains or residue level binding sites. And lastly, it's possible to determine the uh, antibody concentrations, such as those found in crude supernatants, um, which is quickly done with the quantitation workflow. And this can be useful if uh, it's necessary to normalize the amount of protein present in crude supernatants. So what we did on the LSA was to do epitope binning of the antibodies from B-cell cloning versus hybridoma. So we had 24 antibodies from B-cell cloning and 41 from the hybridoma campaign. And they were evaluated for kinetics as well as epitope binning. So a covalent array was prepared using two antibody concentrations. And the array was first used for binding kinetics using four different concentrations of the PDL1 ECD. And then the same array was then used to do a classical sandwich epitope binning assay in a pairwise manner. And so the instrument ran for 30 hours, generating over 35,000 sensograms. And that would have taken about a month to complete by a Beacore 8K. What we also found very useful in this analysis was to generate um, through the, the software on the LSA, the community plots. So we were able to uh, categorize our antibodies based on the relationships of uh, the binding properties in the pairwise sandwich uh, ELISA assay or, or epitope binning assay. So shown on this slide is the ISO affinity plot that was generated on the LSA, looking at the B-cell cloning in green, hybridoma in blue, and benchmark antibodies in red. And you can see there are several hybridoma antibodies. Um, at least seven were identified um, with uh, B-cell cloning, and 15 were identified from hy hybridoma that had high affinity. Um, if we compared the correlation of the LSA to the 8K, we found that there was really good correlation between these two methods um, with a, a, a fairly high R-squared value. So the, the data coming from two of these methods did line up very nicely. And in this analysis is... Uh, uh, the network plot. And so on the left-hand side, we um, are looking at the antibodies coming from either B-cell cloning 
or Hybridoma, so B-cell cloning in red, Hybridoma in blue, and the benchmark antibodies in yellow. And you can see that the number of bins that the blue um, colored antibodies are in is uh, representative of 13 total bins. And so that's a broader epitope coverage um, from the Hybridoma antibodies compared to B-cell cloning, which actually uh, clustered primarily in four different bins. And you can see that the B-cell cloning antibodies um, also uh, were categorized in the same bins as the benchmark antibodies in yellow. So if you toggle your eyes back and forth between um, the plot on the left, which is colored by antibody source, and the one on the right, which is colored by potency in the blocking assay, so the IC50 values, you can see the general trend that if the antibody is red on the left, it tends to be shades of red or darker orange on the right, meaning higher potency in the blocking assay, whereas the antibodies that are blue tend to be um, varied in terms of the, the gradient of color that you see here. So there tends to be more lighter orange, yellow, and um, even green, suggesting that the hybridoma antibodies in general um, hit several different epitope bins. However, the potency of those was, was quite variable across all of those bins. So in this slide, what we're showing is the clustering trees of paired VHBL antibody sequences from the B-cell cloning method. So in red are um, the benchmark antibodies, and in green are two of the highest affinity antibodies that came out of B-cell cloning. So you can see that most of the antibodies that we pulled out were unique sequences, and when we later compared that with the hybridoma antibodies in terms of sequence diversity, we found that three of the trees had only hybridoma antibodies, and then a separate three trees had only B-cell cloning antibodies, and then five of them actually had a combination of both hybridoma and B-cell cloning hits. So all of this taken together suggests that um, as far as antibody discovery um, techniques, it is possible to pull out unique antibodies from each of these different methods. So this is a summary of uh, all of the characterization data that we generated from the B-cell cloning antibodies. Um, and we're, we're ranking these based on blocking assay IC50 values. And you can see in green are the benchmark antibodies. And so most of the B-cell cloning antibodies had equivalent or sometimes even slightly better IC50 values compared to the benchmark antibodies. Many of them bound to human PDL1 by ELISA as well as FACS, and a lot of them bound to Sino PDL1 by FACS, although um, there was variability in the degree of binding with some of these candidates, and again, that might have been because we had not actually screened for Sino binding on the Beacon platform, but we could have, that's something we certainly could have done. Um, we had a majority of these antibodies that did have good binding profiles, also had blocking activity, and um, at least uh, 16 of them had blocking activity that was uh, comparable to the benchmark antibodies. And then two of them had affinity that was in range of the benchmark antibodies at that sub-nanomolar level. So in this slide, we're showing the B-cell cloning um, method compared to hybridoma. So total screen, obviously, um, tips in favor of Beacon being able to screen tens of thousands. Um, the time to sequence now, this includes the animal immunization campaign. And so it's quicker with the B-cell cloning on the Beacon platform um, rather than uh, waiting for uh, sort of the later stages of the screening process to get that sequence information. The selection of the blockers um, on the Beacon platform, it's image-based, whereas we used um, quantitative ELISA to evaluate blocking activity. We cast a broader net by Hybridoma to get 31 to 100% blocking activity being called out as a hit by Hybridoma.
Whereas um, on the Beacon platform, if it was negative for PD-1 Alexa Floor 488 signal, those were um, the ones that were selected. So it, it might have been a, a more stringent, stringent criteria that was used for selecting blocking antibodies. Um, the initial number of blockers was about 35 for Beacon. It was over 40 for Hyperdoma. Um, we ended up finding um, uh, good candidates that had high affinity by both uh, B-cell cloning as well as Hybridoma, but the correlation between having uh, picomolar affinity and potent blocking activity was tipped in favor of B-cell cloning. Um, we had more candidates that had um, blocking IC50 values either similar to or greater than the benchmark antibodies, and we had a um, uh, greater number of antibodies that had uh, activity, functional activity, in an ortho orthogonal functional assay, so T-cell activation assay. We had 9 out of 24 of the candidates that had good activity in this assay from B-cell cloning compared to 4 out of 41 um, in the Hybridoma campaign. And this is an important point because we only screened for one um, functional outcome on the beacon, and that was blocking activity. Um, but you'd really like to see that uh, there's functional activity across uh, a, a wide variety of functional assays. So, so this was promising for us to see um, activity in, in other functional assays. So in this slide here, what we're showing is the challenges that it's basically a function of hybridoma screening. So um, again, in the primary screening stage, we cast a broad net. So anything between 30% and 100% um, inhibition in the blocking assay at the hybridoma supernatant stage was moved forward. Um, but one with 45% uh, initial blocking, you can see MAP 37 there, um, turned out to be a really, really strong blocker once we evaluated purified antibodies. But there's other cases where there's um, activity that looks really, really good at the primary screening stage, and then at the final screen, um, the, the activity appeared to be lost. And that, that sometimes happens with hybridoma. But luckily, a majority of the candidates, so 68% of them, um, had blocking activity in the primary screen and also showed blocking activity in the final uh, screen as well. Um, but many with the low percentage of blocking activity remained low, so that means that it's a low efficiency screening method and it's possible that we're pulling forward candidates that actually don't have the desired functional properties that we are seeking. So in summary, what we found from our hybridoma versus B-cell cloning um, evaluation was that we had more blockers and high affinity antibodies identified from the hybridoma approach, um, representing 13 different epitope bins. Um, that's what the LSA uh, data showed us. Um, but unfortunately, none of them were more potent than benchmark antibodies in the blocking assay, and the affinity did not always correlate uh, as well with potency. And fewer had functional activity in a, an orthotic, orthogonal T-cell activation assay. Um, in contrast, the B-cell cloning on the beacon enabled accelerated discovery of the antibodies, greater sampling of the immune repertoire to identify the potent blocking antibodies. Um, we had, out of those 35, two of them with subnanimal or affinity that correlated well with the potency. And we had a greater number of antibodies that had functional activity in the T-cell activation assay. And so we think that by focusing in on the antibodies that had that very strong inhibitory activity by that image-based method really enabled us to pull through um, very strong binders initially on the beacon platform. And we just don't have that ability to be able to select um, candidates from hybridoma with, with that much confidence um, because we're relying on
um, ELISA-based method that that can um, lead to pulling forward candidates that maybe lose uh, functional activity during the subsequent uh, steps of subcloning. And so we were very fortunate to be able to take these antibodies from hybridoma and B-cell cloning and evaluate them on the LSA. So the LSA's low sample requirements and speed really aligned well with what we were trying to do here and compare um, the different antibody platforms. We measured affinity on the LSA that correlated well with the lower throughput techniques, um, including the Biacore 8K. Um, the network plots were invaluable. Um, we typically do epitope binning by competition ELISA, and we had done that evaluation, in fact, um, and the relationships between the antibodies, uh, we just did not have the level of resolution that we were able to then see after looking at the LSA data. And just having those network plots really revealed relationships between antibodies with a much higher level of resolution and even hinted at sequence similarities um, for the hybridoma antibodies. Again, we're not picking candidates based on sequence yet for the hybridoma antibodies. We basically have to make calls earlier in the process before we even know how diverse the antibodies are and it's possible to even pull forward multiple antibodies that have the exact same sequence. And so having a, a technology available such as the LSA can help you to select um, candidates and get a hint at how diverse they are in terms of the epitope coverage. So it can certainly add value during the supernatant screening stage to select um, the top candidates. And so what we see um, for future potential is that combining um, a beacon analysis with the LSA can be really disruptive. So it enables direct and rapid interrogation of the immune repertoire to find rare candidates for challenging targets. And although PDL1 is not considered a challenging target, it's certainly not a high frequency event to pull out an antibody that is subnanimal or affinity and um, has, has potency in a, in a blocking assay as well as orthogonal functional assays. Um, so we think that we'll be able to pull out candidates that are really agnostic to therapeutic mechanism of action, therapeutic area, as well as target class, and really select um, target-specific potent antibodies that have the desired affinity, specificity, as well as functional properties earlier in the drug discovery process. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Cartera again for inviting us to present this story today and for contributing to the data presented here. Also acknowledging Berkeley Lights for their help on the Beacon platform uh, for the proof of concept study. Um, acknowledge the Shanghai team in, at Chem Partner for generating all of the reagents and antibodies as well as characterizing um, the antibodies by both uh, uh, discovery methods and um, also showing the chem partner team in South San Francisco who's focused on um, the B-cell cloning effort. Thanks so much for tuning into this webinar and now we're happy to take your questions. We have myself from chem partner, Anupam Singhal from Berkeley Lights, and Noah Ditto from Cartera. Thank you, Shireen, for that very informative presentation. Now we will take questions from the audience. If you have any questions, please submit them in the question box on the right. Shireen, was there a correlation between epitope bins as predicted by the LSA network plot and antibody sequence diversity?
That's a great question. Um, so what we found is that, um, interestingly, the um, there was a correlation um, between the epitope binning, the antibodies that that uh, were clustered together in the same bin, and the sequence diversity, suggesting that, um, and, and it's not that shocking because when you actually do those analyses, you kind of predict that similar antibodies would cluster together. Um, but having that level of resolution that the LSA provided did give us a hint. And with the B-cell cloning, we already had the sequences, so we could kind of see that um, pattern emerge. With the hybridoma, we did not actually have the sequence information for that broad set of 41 antibodies. So it was very useful, actually, to have that, um, that clustering and, and network plot information up front because we could potentially pick the candidates that had more um, potential sequence diversity. So it was a very interesting uh, correlation indeed. Thank you, Shereen. Noah, are there technical differences in screening affinity for hybridoma versus B cell derived antibodies? Yeah, good question, John. Uh, generally speaking, no, there would not be. Uh, really, it comes down to considerations about um, the titers that are in the samples themselves, uh, in other words, absolute antibody concentrations. Um, but the, the matrices they're in um, it really is, is not um, influenced in the LSA. So typically in the LSA, we capture the clones onto the surface using maybe an anti-FC surface, for example. Um, that would effectively do an on-chip enrichment um, for the experiment, uh, and it means that um, really any background matrices are washed away before we initiate the antigen titration across that surface to assess binding kinetics. Uh, so in short, really any, any crude matrices that came up to the instrument uh, really um, would not uh, impact uh, the, the downstream binding kinetics measured. Okay. Shreen, do you have access to transgenic rodents to generate fully human antibodies? So um, we have actually done a proof of concept study with the Triani mouse, um, very similar to the study done here with anti pdl one um, as a test case. And we were able to pull out um, very uh, potent antibodies through that campaign as well. So, so it's certainly something that um, works quite well on that platform. And so um, typically for our um, relationship with um, any of these companies that have transgenic animals, you typically would have to go get a license for that and then uh, can come to us and we can certainly execute on that. Thank you. Anupam, do you have any other examples of where the ligand receptor blocking assay on the beacon has been used to down-select lead candidates? Right, that's a great question. Um, there have been other uh, examples, and the most recent of which is um, in the current COVID-19 situation, uh, we had uh, collaborators at Vanderbilt University use the assay to identify antibodies that that blocked the interaction between the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus spike protein, um, as well as the human ACE2 receptor. And, and that's a, a key function in terms of infection of the virus. Okay. Shireen, what are the most challenging aspects of functional assay development on the Beacon platform? Uh, so, so the most uh, challenging part is actually how good the reagents are. So the, our approach is to actually generate the reagents and QC them by fax to ensure that we have um, kind of a robust signal up front before even going on to the Beacon platform. So if you already have a, a, a very good set of reagents and a good readout by either Fax or ELISA, in general, we've been able to transfer those assays onto the beacon and be able to maintain that uh, dynamic range. 
So again, it really starts with the reagents themselves, ensuring that you're actually going to get that signal um, off the platform using fax or some other method. And then in general, it tends to translate um, fairly well onto the beacon. Thank you, Shireen. A question about are you able to enrich B cell population to get a higher hit rate? Yeah, so um, I, I, I can uh, start to answer that and Anupam can maybe chime in as well. So typically what we do is um, magnetic uh, B cell isolation. So we enrich for CD138 positive B cells. Uh, first, before going on to the platform, um, it is possible to look for antigen specific binding up front as well um, as another enrichment uh, criteria, but we tend to, in general, uh, like to pull forward all of the CD138 positive cells for, for mouse, of course. Um, for human, we're using a slightly different magnetic uh, isolation and enrichment uh, procedure starting from the memory. B cells, um, but certainly very important to enrich up front before loading onto the beacon. Yeah, I, I think Shireen has covered um, what I would say, and and I would just re-echo that you know the the system itself is capable of screening any B cell population, but the better you are able to create a pure uh, secretory population, the the greater the hit rates that you're going. using a combination of markers, um, positive and negative selection on facts, or whether it's using, um, you know, standard magnetic uh, enrichment, you know, the, the system can, can operate with any of those samples. Um, and obviously performance will be dependent on how effectively the enrichment um, is performed. Noah, in the presentation, there were examples of 8K and LSA data aligning in terms of affinity. What about on and off rates? Yeah, so um, the plot did reference affinity, and I, I think this question is leading towards the concern that when you measure on and off rates, you can have um, a different on and on rate um, leading to the same uh, measured affinity in the end by varying the two uh, components used as part of the affinity equation. Um, and, and that's a good point. There's actually been a, a nice manuscript that was put out recently um, by an author, Brown, at uh, Adam Abb, who was the lead author on it, um, comparing um, a variety of things, one of which was um, kind of on and on rates measured on the LSA and versus the number of technologies. Um, and actually, in that comparison, it included the Viacore 8K as well, which is referenced here. Um, that's a nice, um, there was a really nice correlation in there of both on and off rates as well as calculated affinities um, shown in that data set for a, for a reasonably sized protein um, antigen. Uh, so the short answer would be yes, the, the expectation is there that you would get comparable off rates between the two platforms um, once you optimize your assay conditions. Thank you. Shreen, do you have a sense of the frequency for false negative blocking antibodies on the beacon? That's a really important question. Um, so we actually decided to go back and take um, 20 of the binding antibodies um, and uh, move through the entire process of sequencing, express purify, and characterize. And of those 20, um, only two of them had binding activity. Um, well, they all had binding activity, but only two of them had blocking activity, suggesting that we were not losing um, real blockers early in the process. And even when we compared the blocking activity of those two that we would consider kind of, you know, false negatives, they were not as potent as the ones that were selected. So the, it depends on the criteria that you use to select your blocking antibodies, but we set it at a pretty high bar um, by that image-based method. And if it had weaker um, signal there, we just passed on that. And then that actually turned out to be um, less potent antibodies 
once we looked at the purified um, uh, reagents. So we feel that um, the false positive rate, at least for this study, was, was fairly low and, and within an acceptable range. Thank you, Shereen. We have a question about discussing the improved T cell activation a little bit more, uh, single B cell versus hy hybridoma derived antibodies. Yeah, so um, so I hadn't shown that data, but um, the it was really a, a function of how many of them had that activity, and there were more that had the uh, functional activity from the B cell cloning candidates compared to hybridoma. Um, when when I when I refer to T cell activation, the 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 number that came from hybridoma did have reasonable activity. It's not that there was a lot of difference in terms of the amount of activation. It was that there, there were a greater number that came from the B cell cloning um, effort. Oh, thank you. Anupam, are there new features for antibody discovery workflow on the beacon? Yeah, so um, since since the time that we performed this um, proof of concept with uh, with Shireen and Chem Partner, uh, we've launched uh, what we call Opto Plasma B Discovery 2.0, um, and that uh, that workflow now has increased the screening throughput, um, as well as introduced a new on chip genomics capability where you can perform uh, on chip cDNA synthesis to simplify. Uh, the re sequence recovery from from B cells. Thank you, Anupam. Noah, can you perform epitope binning and kinetics using the same chip? Uh, yes, you can. It, it, there's a little bit of a nuance in kind of how you're setting it up, um, particularly because in, in SPR you want to have a, a sort of optimal density of the antibody on the surface for the assay you're, you're attempting. But the short answer is yes. There's a number of customers that do uh, like this approach because they can take one sensor chip and, and get two assay, two data sets um, out of the same surface. So they would typically mobilize the uh, antibodies across the surface in an array format, just like Shireen had sort of described in her presentation, um, and then come in, um, in in a kinetics assay, typically up front to assess um, binding interactions, and then on that same surface, come in with a competitive epitope format um, as well. Uh, it, there's some cases where maybe the attachment of the antigen might need to be different between the two assays. So that's might dictate running a separate experiment, but in cases where um, the same attachment mechanism is suitable for both approaches, it definitely can be done. Thank you, Noah. Uh, Cartera has partnered with the Gates Foundation and the La Jolla Institute of Immunology to analyze and screen and characterize therapeutic antibodies. Noah, could you give us a little detail about um, our work with uh, analyzing therapeutic antibodies for COVID? Yeah, yeah. So for COVID, um, a lot of the assays kind of described here by Shireen on the LSA are, are playing out in the real world in, in the fight against, um, you know, uh, COVID and trying to find treatments, therapeutic or vaccine related. Um, so there's a number of customers um, that have publicly announced uh, um, activities that are using the LSA. This includes Abcelera and Eli Lilly, uh, Distributed Bio as well, um, to name a few. Um, and they're all they're all doing very similar assays like this, finding funding antibodies, typically actually from patient derived sources, um, doing really detailed characterization. Um, and really, the speed of the platform is the key here because um, it's, it's quite obvious to everybody that there's very limited amount of time here to find a treatment, and the world's population is kind of depending on a, a treatment um, in some form or another. Um, so customers have been gravitating to this platform uh, just for the sake of the speed, the throughput. They don't need much sample to get going. Um, and in the case of uh, Eli Lilly, they already have a candidate in a phase one uh, antibody candidate, um, which is incredible um, how fast they turned around um, uh, the, from, from generating a patient-derived antibody to, to actually getting into phase one. Um, and, and the LSA being part of that workflow, I think, is really critical and speaks to uh, its 
its ability to to um, support rapid um, therapeutic discovery activities. Thank you, Noah. Shireen, could you please give details about your immunization protocols? What adjuvants do you use? Is there any protocol to increase the number of B-cell clones with higher affinity and recognize native and diverse epitopes? Yeah, that's a, that's a um, really important question. Um, I can certainly follow up um, with the um, details about the immunization strategy. Um, in terms of finding candidates that actually have um, the higher affinity and native and diverse epitopes, I think it's all in the screening. So you really have to have the right um, reagents um, available to, to look at whether you're getting um, a diverse um, uh, binding to different sites on the protein, for example. But I think um, really it, it has to do, you can't actually rank on affinity on the beacon from my experience. Um, Anupa might be able to, to shed more light on that at this stage, but we're basically looking binding to cells or to um, beads coated with a particular protein. So we do like looking at bead binding versus cell-based binding because it's similar to looking at facts versus ELISA. And um, of course, it's just a different presentation of the protein, whether it's recombinant or expressed on a cell. Um, but having those two things together can be very helpful. Um, and then uh, just being able to screen deeper and evaluate as many as possible, I think, is, is another angle we've taken on that. But maybe Anupam can talk more about um, uh, potentially affinity uh, ranking. Yeah, um, thanks, Shireen. So just on the on that comment regarding the different assays that you can perform. Um, so we do believe that the combination of the recombinant, uh, the soluble protein assay or, or on the beads, um, and the cell-based assay will help you discriminate those antibodies that are binding to the native antigen, um, which is often not um, expressible in recombinant form. Um, in terms of affinities, um, you know, we have, uh, we have different customers that have, have tackled this in different ways. Um, running multiple assays at different antigen concentrations is, is one way um, that you can kind of infer um, how strong a signal it is. Um, but basically, I, th I think right now the, the main benefit is that you're able to select which ones are, are binding to the, the native antigen by performing multiple assays. Well, thank you, uh, Shireen, so much for that very informative presentation. Uh, we've reached the end of the hour, and uh, thank you, Anupam and Noah, on our panel for answering these very informative questions. I would like to thank the audience for attending our webinar today, and I hope you all have a really great day. Thank you for attending. <laughs>